Hey. Hello, everyone. <laughs> can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. I can't see you, though. Uh, can you see me? <laughs> yeah. Everyone can see you. Well, that's great. That's great. <laughs> so we have, what, 10 minutes for some Q&A? Yes, we do roughly that. Have you got any questions on the Slido that have come up? Yeah, yeah. So, so let's just dive into the Slido questions. Um, the the top question at the moment is from Kirsten, uh, saying, "How do you include those without access to technology?" Um, interestingly, I just came back from one of the most rural areas. Uh, it's not even in Taiwan. It's in Penghu, a very um, a remote island uh, close to Taiwan, and in an even more remote island. Uh, in the Penghu area was just at the first marine uh, national park that was um, recently introduced for just three years. And there was a dispute uh, with the local fishes people uh, and when people petitioned for a total banning of uh, fisheries, especially uh, <coughs> like the, the uh, drill nets and so on. Uh, and, and so we went there. And so to, to put a very quick answer to the question, we, we do it by bringing the tech to people. We're not asking people to come to the um, websites. If it's just for the internet voting or whatever, of course the, the local fishers people will protest because they don't have the, the same access um, to the internet and they, they're not very used to it anyway. So because of this, we use this huge um, town hall style meeting where people both see the people uh, in the room doing deliberation and also have their own open mic uh, moments and the whole um, endeavor was 360 recorded. So the net, net effect is that uh, for a local person, you either just walk into a, a nearby town hall or just you use your own phone and on Slido or you can call your friend and ask them to relay your message and so on. And, and so the, the whole idea is that uh, the local mayors and local representatives see it as an extension of their face-to-face uh, -face deliberation methods and not a replacement. Whenever it's replacement, I think there's a lot of worry, but we're not trying to replace face-to-face -face meetings. We're trying to augment it and trying using 360 live streaming and VR to make best use of people's time because people can then enter the previous discussion as if they're there and then uh, have a you know five minutes, 10 minutes experience of what it's like uh, to, to be diving there, to be fishing there and so on before entering the discussion so that they share the some uh, common uh, effects. So it was pretty successful. Uh, the deliberation yesterday was, I think, the, the most peaceful any uh, similar uh, meetings the, the place has ever seen. Uh, and we actually managed to come up with some consensus. So, so I think that's a, a pretty good sign of what we call a assistive uh, civic technology. It's not uh, trying to replace uh, any existing technologies, but just like good assistive tech, they disappear. Um, when people use it and using ambient computing, uh, people just speak naturally and then their consensus is mapped um, automatically uh, into post-it notes. We transcribe everything everybody says and uh, the mind maps and everything uh, into the stakeholder maps, the post-it notes and everything. And then so people after walking away from the meeting, they don't just remember one or two sentences, but actually the full uh, map. Of, of what was being discussed, and then this carries on to the next meetings and so on. Uh, the next question is, how do you prevent open government from manipulation by root actors with malicious intent? So the answer is twofold. The first one is, of course, we work on very good cybersecurity measures, sandboxing, active, you know, white hat penetration testing, everything, uh, to make sure the infrastructure itself uh, is safe. I think that's the, the foundation of open government. Now, on the top level, on the content level, we design the space so that you can't reply to anyone. So um, there's a similarity between Slido and the polis, which you just saw we use in the Uber case, and the petition uh, platform that we use. Um, and they all have the same design in that people are free to voice their concerns and post their ideas, but you can't ever reply to each other. So basically, the best way to counter an argument that you don't agree with is posting a better counter argument and have it upvoted. And so um, throughout this design, it, it doesn't pay to be a troll because you can't really consume other people's attention. 
And this is the, the idea of, of troll control or troll hugging that we use when we design spaces like this. It's just taking away the replies and, you, and use crowd moderation. Um, what is the most important piece of digital infrastructure that has yet to be developed? Um, we'll notice that uh, for machine learning for AI, we currently use it only for cases where it will be the same, just more time consuming if it's a human doing the same thing. We don't actually use AI for places where you know it needs value judgments and so on. Um, but we, I think in order for AI to enter that part, a full development of what we call explainable AI, XAI, is essential. It's important that, uh, like a good assistant, uh, the, the uh, AI doesn't just tell you it's a cat, but actually tells you the, the reasoning behind it. And it's a very new development field. We expect maybe two or three years before we have a good understanding of how explainable AI could work. But I think this is a very important part of digital infrastructure if we are going to automate more of the uh, human in this uh, elaboration process. George would like to know your leapfrogging uh, slow political um, evolutionary change using modern tech. How do you handle people generational gaps? Well, as I explained uh, for the older people, for people who are not used to uh, keyboard and, and mouse, actually they're pretty comfortable uh, with a 360 camera. They're pretty comfortable with VR and AR because you know it doesn't require learning a new modality. It's basically just acting naturally and with the room itself acting as a computer. Uh, and so that's, that's where our current research mostly lies. We're not really um, focusing on getting people to use more keyboard and more mouse, but rather to use uh, computing devices as a way to connect uh, disparate spaces, but each space is still a communi community space. And I think that that has broad implications uh, even for elders uh, who can't travel, they have to remain home, but they can feel connected through this kind of um, public forums uh, in augmented reality or, or through ambient uh, computing technologies. So that's, that's our current focus. Has your approach to urban government found any uptake in other countries? Yes, I think um, the New York City, uh, there's a, um, I think, called Civic Hall, uh, is looking into our methodology and making a documentary and a write-up. Uh, and one of our architects in, in Peters is now in Tokyo and working with um, the people in Japan. And there's also, um, like, cooperations between the Eta Lab in France. Um, the people in Madrid, I just virtually visited Barcelona, uh, and so on. So there, there's many city-level governments who very much want this thing because their mayors were ele elected on this platform, and there's a, a wider uh, internet community just focusing on this. So we think we're just one of the larger labs, but we, we certainly are very willing to share and include uh, methodology developed elsewhere as well. Where well, can technologists direct their energies to realize your optimistic future? Well, I, I encourage you to realize your optimistic future. It's not my optimistic future. Uh, but, but I think what, what helps is, of course, to, to publish uh, in an open source in a reproducible way and write good postmortems. Uh, because in, in conferences like this, uh, it's, it's generally not what, what, what the failures or the, the lessons learned were not explored in depth. They're mentioned, but kind of just part of the narrative. And uh, what I like most, uh, and I try to do myself, is this idea of radical transparency. If something doesn't work, it's as important uh, to document it and learn from it as, as it works. right? So I think that that's something that I'm also uh, focusing myself, and I would encourage you to also try. is just to try all sorts of different things and fail early and uh, provide write-ups. Do you feel you're a bit better able to influence from within the government than as an activist? Well, well, the funny thing is that I'm still an activist uh, inside the government. I, I don't, uh, as a condition of joining the cabinet, I don't look at any confidential or top secret information. So there's no chance of, you know, ever Snowden being the, the government. So in exchange, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm able to publish everything literally I see uh, as, as a freedom of information compatible documents. So I, I'm very much thinking that this works bidirectionally. Uh, I'm both lowering the fear, and certainly doubt, of public servants when it comes to civic participation. But as an activist, I'm also uh, letting other activists know that there are career public servants who are willing to work this way. They were, you know, muted or something, but I'm kind of their their voice as well uh, to try to make them. Um, more visible and also more more vocal. And when people see career public servants help with their activist agenda, they build rapport. 
Right. So how do you make sure that crowdsourced solutions and governance doesn't end up harming marginalized communities who don't have the largest numbers? It's easy. We don't vote. Uh, we don't ever vote. Um, the petitions you see, the crowd consensus you see, everything, we don't count the numbers. If there are a hundred people <coughs> having the same um, question, it's just one card on this mind map. It's just one dot on the polis. It's just one sentence on Slido. So all the, all the tech that we use, uh, we, we look for diversity. We're not looking for sheer numbers. And it doesn't it really work uh, to, to have a crowd that votes exactly the same way. It doesn't influence the process at all. So what we value is a point that is different from everybody else, but can somehow work everybody else's points. Um, how do you balance transparency and privacy? Well, well, these two are not at all at odds. I think when people entrust their uh, data in the government to store it, well, it's still their data, right? We're just a data um, controller or a data processor. And, and in that, that case, we will not be you know, thinking this is transparent. We need to be accountable in how we store and process those private data. But when we publish something under FOIA or under open data, we always do it in a statistical form. And I think it's much easier, much better, and especially under a, a GDPR regime, um, for the scholarly community to propose uh, algorithms, but for the data owners and controller to run it locally. So instead of publishing private data as data, we need to make sure that there's less uh, or there's no privacy impact before running those statistics algorithms. All right, so they're telling me it's the last question. Uh, is there a danger in this system become a mechanism for pushing a populist agenda? I, I think when, when, when everybody has a, a way to push a populist agenda, this is what democracy means, right? So what, what, what we're trying to do is that we are making everybody a potential uh, agitator, a potential activist, uh, and not just uh, centering it to two or three so-called thought leaders. So like every Friday we process um, a, a petition and everybody takes turns to become a populist leader. And when, once that's uh, demystified, I think there's much more chance of a true democracy developing based on listening to each other. So thank you for listening.